If you're new here, welcome. This is the Infamous Archive. You may recognize my voice from my main channel and other content. I cover different online personalities, mostly fitness related. This channel is going to be more focused on crime, real life events, mysteries, or anything else that interests me that doesn't really fit the main channel. Future live streams are also probably going to be here. Now with that out of the way, I have a pretty interesting story I want to tell you guys about. Sometimes a fighter gets his fame from a dramatic comeback. Some get their glory from dominating the sport from their peak. And then sometimes a fighter becomes famous for what he does outside of the ring. This video is about one of the most dangerous fighters to ever walk inside or outside of the octagon. Lee Murray was born in 1977 in South London. His neighborhood was well known and not for the best reasons. The area he grew up in was rampant with organized crime. His parents worked menial jobs, his mother was a hairdresser, his father was a kitchen hand in Morocco. Lee and his father always had a rough relationship, even when he was younger. His father was absent for the first seven years of his life, and this caused friction when his father immediately demanded respect from Lee, who has always been rebellious in nature. His father also heavily drank, and that often led to physical altercations. Growing up wasn't easy for Lee, and with no interest in school, and growing up in a low-income family with a drunk father, Lee was inevitably pushed to the streets as he grew into his teens. And the streets is one place where he would excel. Even as a teenager, he was dangerous. When Lee was in his late teens, he and a group of his close friends had a small feud with a local drug dealer and his crew. And as a result, Lee and his friends ended up beating up and driving out the whole gang, and then taking their place. This incident, in my opinion, opened the door to the world of organized crime for Lee. And it would change his life forever. Growing up, Lee was always a tough son of a bitch. In 1999, after almost landing himself in jail, he was introduced to MMA, and he actually got to test himself. By the end of the year, he was fighting for an event called Millennial Brawl. Lee quickly knocked his opponent out in the first round. The event promoter even said, he's so quick they call him Lightning Lee Murray, and that's the origin of his nickname. In no way does Lee have the best record. He was only actively training and fighting for five years, and he only fought in the USA once before his career ended prematurely. which we will cover in a bit. But first, you may have noticed a name or two on Lee's fight list. That's right, his last fight was actually against Anderson the Spider Silva for the vacant Cage Rage title. Their fight took place right before Anderson would go on to dominate the UFC middleweight division. And in the end, Anderson Silva would prove to be a little too much for Lee. But you can see Lee is dominating now the stand-up. Silva on his back foot, Lee's pushing forward. Anderson Silva's just keeping back slightly. Because I think he knows he's got it in the tank. Lee needs to force the issue and really hurt him now. He really needs to hurt him. Anderson Silva with a good take now. Both men to their ground. Three rounds later. I think it's Silva. I think Silva's got this. But you have to give him credit, he did last the whole 15 minutes with the spider. Even though Lee's MMA career would come to an end after his fight with the future champ, it wasn't the fight he's most famous for. This is kind of the irony in Lee's fight career, because the fight he's best known for wasn't even a legitimate fight. The fight that everybody's gonna remember Lee for was actually a street fight that took place outside of a bar after UFC 38 in 2002. This was just barely before the time of iPhones and cameras, so unfortunately we have nothing on record and we have to go by what people said. But with knowing that, the story goes like this. A bunch of MMA fighters that were friends are drinking and partying at a bar after UFC 38. Some of the people involved in this are Lee, Pat Miletic, Matt Hughes, Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz. While they were outside, Lee got in an altercation with Tito's friend and ended up punching him out, which caused Tito to rush to his aid. Bear in mind, at this time Tito was the UFC heavyweight champ. The story according to Pat, Chuck and Matt Hughes is that Tito came towards Lee swinging punches and Lee dodged and then countered with 4 or 5 punches which caused Tito to drop to his knees. Lee then slid in a kick or two to Tito's giant face before Pat Militich pulled him off. Tito threw a left hook at him and missed. Lee obviously ducked out of the way, threw a five punch combo. Every punch connected perfectly, bone on bone. Just, you can hear him, very solid shots. Tito went down, Lee kicked him in the head twice. Even though it was, you know, argued by Tito, the world champ got throttled in an alley by, uh, by an English, English MMA fighter and 
you know, stardom was born. He wasn't unconscious, but he wasn't in a good position. According to Tito, well, he tells it a different story every time he tells it. Took a swing at me, missed. I took a swing at him, I clinched him, I kneed him. Um, he broke away, he started running away, I started chasing him to him, and he turns around and stops and plants his feet. I go to stop and I slide right into him. He clipped me, dropped me, and I popped right back up. I chased Lee Murray down and uh, he turned around and posed off to me and I slid into, slid into him and he punched me and dropped me to my knee. At the time I just came off a knee surgery, I had an uh, ACL replacement a month prior. And uh, I clinched him, kneed him in the face a couple times, cop ripped us apart. And... Uh, the Lee Murray story, <laughs> I want to hear your, your version of it, because I've heard so many versions, I want to hear from you yourself. Well, I, I was there. I, uh... <laughs> Lee Murray is a part of Mafia, so I'll leave it at that. I won't answer it. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those situations. So I think we've established that during Lee's time, he was a pretty dangerous fighter in the ring. But in reality, it's nothing compared to his life outside of fighting. On the morning of February the 22nd, 2006, news broke of the biggest cash robbery in British history. Forget the great train robbery, forget the Northern Bank in Belfast. Britain's biggest ever robbery took place in the early hours of this morning in Kent. In February 2006, the largest cash robbery in Britain's history took place. Seven highly prepared bank robbers got away with £53 million or $92 million, give or take. Hours before the bank robbery took place, the criminals pulled over the head security manager and kidnapped him at gunpoint. They then went to his house and took his family hostage. The security manager was also told that if he wanted them to be safe, he had to cooperate with the robbers. With the help of the security manager, they were able to get in unnoticed. They shut down the alarm system and gained access to the cash rooms and security office and easily caught the remaining guards and employees by surprise and took them hostage also. With free access to the whole building, they backed a van in and used the forklift to fill in as much money as they could. In little over an hour, seven bank robbers were able to make it out of there with nearly a hundred million dollars. And none of the hostages were harmed, they were actually freed a few hours later during the morning. As you can expect, this was a huge deal, and in no time a massive manhunt and investigation was on. They were able to gather some DNA from the cash crates, and a two million dollar reward was offered for any information. As you can imagine, tips quickly flooded in. The police were able to track down one of the vehicles used in the robbery that had a large chunk of the money in there still, along with some masks and equipment. Soon after that, another tip led to the arrest of a makeup artist. One of the containers she had had a name on it, L. Murray. That in itself wasn't enough to implicate Lee, but it did give the police the key they needed. See, a few weeks before the heist even took place, Lee got arrested while driving his Ferrari and he got it impounded. The police didn't really have a reason to search his car at the time, but they did now, and after clearing out the whole car, they found a cell phone under the seat. In the cell phone, there was a recording of Lee and one of his partners talking about the bank heist during its planning stages, before it even happened, showing his clear knowledge of it, and maybe he even controlled some aspects of the planning. Too bad though, because by the time they figured out that Lee was involved in the robbery, he had already left the country and bought a golden Mercedes and a million dollar villa in Morocco. Even though he was protected from being extradited, his success was only short lived, because Murray is one of those guys that has no problem finding trouble. Three months after his bank heist, he was finally arrested and his villa was raided and as a result they found a large amount of cocaine and money there. Lee was arrested for drug possession and resisting arrest. In February 2007, Lee ended up getting sentenced to 8 months in Morocco. He was held there longer though, while the Britain courts tried to have him extradited back to Britain. Lee fearing that he may end up spending the rest of his life in prison, obviously didn't handle that idea well. And in June 2009, he attempted a breakout. Lee arranged for someone to smuggle him in a small saw that the prison believed he was going to use to cut the iron bars on his window. The only problem with Lee's plan was that he wasn't there when the saw arrived. He was moved to lockup because he was caught with a laptop computer that had internet access. I guess he was catching up on some Netflix. Either way, Murray wasn't in his usual room, and another inmate was rummaging through his stuff and stumbled upon the saw. I'm sure all this played a part in his extended stay. After being held for over three years in court limbo, in 2010, Murray would finally have to deal with the consequences of the bank heist, and he was sentenced to only 10 years in prison. But after a bit of public outrage, they ended up resentencing him, and his sentence was extended to 25 years, which means he's scheduled for release in 2035. The general consensus, though, seems to be that he's not going to have to serve the whole sentence. I think a huge factor that played a part in his sentence extension 
was the public outrage around the fact that not all of the $90 million had been accounted for yet. So it's assumed that Murray still has control of a large amount of it, possibly millions. I guess people had an issue with the mastermind behind one of the world's largest robberies, keeping most of the money and only getting sentenced to 10 years. But at this point we can only speculate, because Murray doesn't really tell the whole story. A lot of people have sought him out over the years for interviews to get his side of what happened. Even though Lee is fairly open in interviews, he still hasn't popped the cork on the robbery. Eventually someone's going to get that interview. I'd personally love to hear from an inside perspective on that heist. For anyone curious, if you want to learn a little bit more about Murray, I'll link an interview with a reporter he did in 2018. It's a seven parter, but it's pretty interesting if you ask me. I'll link it in the pinned comment for you guys. And with that said, I hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you think in the comments.